Hi. Hi, Dede. Good morning, everyone. Or I guess, depending on time zone. Good afternoon, good day, whatever. Hey. Looks like Rita's joining right now.
Rita, for a second, I thought you just like smashed your keyboard there. Yeah, you sure I'm not a bot? <laughs> we'll look back at it and we'll laugh while we are laughing on that text. Well, just for context, because folks ping me and ask if I'm joining the call and I'm like, I quickly type with like, you know, garbage, so. I think we've got uh, something resembling quorum here. Um, yeah, I uh, I only added one thing to the agenda today. I don't know if anyone else had anything that they wanted to chat about, um, but I think we should just do a, a brief check-in on 3.13 um, and probably cut the RC whenever we can. I was looking at the state of things and it looks like the the main one is the external data response caching which the pr looks like it's just about ready to go um i think rita you commented that it was it was good recently so uh, do we feel okay to cut an rc once that's merged uh, do, do you mind like sharing the screen Sure. Uh, of the, the 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 milestone, I believe there were a few things still open. So, so I went on vacation for like almost three weeks, and when I got back, I had completely forgotten my macOS password for my work laptop, and I had to like hard reset my computer, which means that all of my applications that had like system permissions to share my screen no longer do. So we'll see, I'm not gonna quit and reopen, you're just gonna share. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the external data should be pretty quick. Um, I added some comments to it. Uh, please take a look at it when you get a chance. And like, I know uh, you, you had uh, the community's deadlines and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, so today I will, uh, I should be able to get that PR uh, going again. So they are like quick fixes I've seen the comments. So we'll just uh, address and ping you guys well, back. Yeah, it, it should be pretty quick. Um, yeah. I think I review. All of them except the unit test one. Um, so I guess the call to action is uh, everyone review all the PRs that's blocking release, right? If wait, are we are we trying to get pub sub in there because that one probably isn't close to be blocked for alpha, right? Do you, do you mean that PR specifically, Max, the 2846? Uh, let's see, 2846. Yeah, uh, we should talk about that. I, I replied to you. I think uh, the, um, I think Jacob's intention is to fix a bug there. Um, you can take a look at the comment. Maybe we can talk about this in here. Well, yeah, it looks, it's not about audit, right? like whether or not we want to return the error or something. Yeah, it's it's net new functionality, right? And mm -hmm. in all, what, what he's, we're doing mm -hmm. basically is adding a call to PubSub inside of audit, right? So mm -hmm. sure, try to maintain old behavior. I get that, but the larger point of that thread is PubSub is an internet, requests, right, which are unreliable, right? And so the current assumption behind that um, code is on first failure, just give up. 
uh, which maybe is fine, right? But that's definitely a user expectation thing that we're touching on, right? Like, it, are, are, are we saying that um, it's expected that there be a certain percentage of uh, violations that are dropped, right? Um, and 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 obviously, like there's there's going to be some non-zero chance of dropping violations, but you know, do do we want to have something like exponential backoffs, retries? What is the cancellation? Do we go with what we have now? That having alignment there uh, is is I think the issue. And maybe you know, if we're okay with something that's very non-ideal, we're closer. I'm I'm forgetting like what the um, state of the rest of the PR is, to, to be honest, right? Like, it, so uh, depending on what we're okay with for alpha, maybe, you know, it, it's, it's closer to fine as is. Uh, I do suspect if we need more advanced retry logic, that's going to set us back a bit, though. But do, do you see the, um, so if you don't um, change the behavior to the current one, that's going to change our behavior because we already have the pop sub returning errors today. That's a completely separate question from what I'm talking about. Um, I, I agree that he's trying to like keep the behavior consistent in that one PR. I believe he's doing it in the wrong place. Uh, if if we're just swallowing errors entirely at that level, uh, because I think that's going to lead to potentially unexpected code changes or results of code changes in the future, right? Like the the problem with audit as it's structured right now is that every function you kind of need to know how every other function is behaving in order to make a change to audit, right? And this is a good example of that, right? Oh, this function, even though it returns an error, shouldn't return an error because that makes the calling function unhappy, right? Um, and, and if someone just wants to update that smaller function, right? they're on the hook for understanding all of that that context right um so Andrew, do you mind sharing your screen uh, if you could click on the link this is what we're talking about right now in the meeting note uh start meeting chat all right thanks so I, i'm happy to have the like code health conversation to me that's kind of like a little bit more boring of a conversation um you know, because there will be an answer. Uh, but the more, I think, salient conversation is what are the user needs we're actually trying to meet with this change? What are the expectations for alpha? And what are the failure modes that we want this code to have, right? And that is separate from whether this function returns an error and whether this, this um, error gets swallowed or not. Does that make sense? That's yeah, so let's talk about the question, the first question, right? I think you you were asking what is the user expectation? Um, I, I can only speak for myself. I, I was thinking like this is why we fix that behavior, right? We want to make sure it's odd is fault tolerant, meaning if there's one one of to your point, like if one of the functions within one of the policies or one of the resources it somehow ended up in an error it's not gonna impact the entire audit process right that's why we fixed that bug um and so if we want the audit process to be fault tolerant um you know so first of all do we do we agree if, if that, that's the desired uh, user experience let's start with that do we want audit to be fault tolerant? I think we ran into issues when it was not fault tolerant before. Like um, if the audit did not have permissions for certain APIs, 
Um, or, or, I mean, I think any, it's, I mean, I think it's just a general statement. Any, anything could actually end up in an error, right? So right. when that happens, that should, should that one error impact the entire audit result? I think it depends, right? Like, uh, there's, there's kind of a spectrum here. Uh, we want certainly audit results that we can report, right? If, if there are audit results. And, and here it was like reporting on like, hey, audit result, audit can't run. I think it, or sorry, audit, audit failed to write results for this one thing, but hey, let's still write out logs. So, so you have those. Um, and it, it probably makes sense to like failure to scan, writing out a scan error, notating it, but like continuing to gather the results you can. Uh, the question then with regard to PubSub though, is what does fault tolerant mean, right? Mm -hmm. um, like pod five has a violation, right? And we send a pub sub notification out for pod five. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, there's a network partition that that pub sub issuing gets dropped on the floor, right? And, and gets returned un undeliverable. Um, do we then just ignore as far as PubSub is concerned, PubFi's error and continue on, mm -hmm. hoping that the next time we run an audit cycle, this, uh, this error will be reported. Bearing in mind that some of these audit cycles can take a long time on larger mm -hmm. clusters, right? This isn't yeah. like, oh, wait 10 seconds. Uh, or is it is there some sort of like retry with jitter and exponential back off for every publish? How does that sort of fit into not interfering with the rest of audit? You know, mm -hmm. because it's, it's fault tolerance for PubSub, but then there's fault tolerance for does the, the train keep going, right? And yeah, do we keep right. logging things? Um, and and I think the answers to that depend on what our users depending on PubSub for, right? Uh, if it's for informational purposes only, right? And do not rely on this, then dropping a lot of stuff on the floor, fine. If, if it is meant to be uh, something that people build their security and reporting infrastructure off of, Right, as, as I said before, like zero messages drops, probably not realistic, right? Um, yeah. But having some probability, right, that's that's fairly low, right? And, and a story for what the uh, error recovery looks like probably is important, right? And so, that's, that's where I say, what are the user expectations here? Because we cannot, know what to do until we know what we want to have as an end result. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, um, at the risk, I mean, I, I want to make sure we don't like try to boil the ocean. Like I, I think uh, total many many valid con uh, concerns that we should totally address going forward. Uh, I hundred percent love that we're looking at audit more. Um, uh, I'm just linking to that PR right to make audit fault tolerant. So this was a reported issue from users, right? Um, it, you know, to to make sure. Uh, when there is an error, an error within the audit, right? We don't want to impact the entire process, right? So uh, for now, at, at, at least, like, do we want to make sure we don't have any, we don't introduce any uh, regressions or, 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 or difference of behavior, right? We, we do today because of the pops up change. So this, the current changes in, in master also um, is a regression on the current 
reporting on the constraints if mm -hmm. PubSub is enabled. Right. So, yeah. So, so coming back to PubSub, right? Um, maybe there's, uh, you know, in terms of when do we retry, how how often we retry. Um, regardless of that decision, like, when there is an error, like when PubSub results in an error, uh, do we do we still return the audit results? Like, do we, do we skip the, the the failure basically, right? Or are we saying we're not clear on the user expectation to make that call right now? Are you asking for a future behavior, Rita, or the current behavior? Kurt, I'm not, no, I'm saying I'm asking the desired behavior. Like what as a as a group, how do we feel about that? When PubSub fails, right? Because it, so, it, it can. Yeah. Yeah, with regard to the larger audit process, I'm okay with like some non-recoverable PubSub error not interrupting that process for okay. sure. Okay. Um, the, the thing that I see missing right now though, and again, maybe we're okay with doing this later, but we do need to do it, mm -hmm. uh, is to have some sort of separate system that retries PubSub failures. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 if if you if this isn't how users are holding this thing right, then that may not be true, right? My my we need to do this is predicated on an assumption about how users will use audit right. pub sub. I think what we need to answer too is it is the absence of this retry logic going to prevent us from putting this out there as an alpha feature? Or do we go forward with the alpha state? So we can do that, right? Yeah, I think yeah. And I, that's I, I what we have to make a decision the, on. I just don't, don't want to regress the current audit process uh, in the process of doing that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would never, to be clear, I was never suggesting that we not suppress the errors. Uh, the first, my first suggestion is that we suggest we suppress the pub sub error next to pub sub, right? And if that function truly should not return an error, we should modify that function signature to just not return an error. Um, just just to avoid future surprises like this, right? Like we add some other reporting system in the future. Um, knowing that we have to suppress the error and knowing that the error will be suppressed will sort of help force the, the discussion we're having now to happen sooner. That's the first and easier bit. Does that sound fine? Yeah. So what's the next step for this PR though? I believe change uh, returning error from the pop sub and log it right there then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just move this error suppression code you have next to pub sub. I would say is sufficient for me, removing the fact that this function can return an error would be ideal, right? Uh, but I don't know how large of a refactoring that would be. I, th I think that was a bug also. I think I added in my comment, it, it never returned an error before. Yeah. The only error we are returning is the pub sub today. We had an a, a, like the return as error, but nothing used it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And we should we should just not yeah. let it return error. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. So but uh, I still have one doubt though uh, on retry thing. Uh, like right now, most of the pubs, are popular pubs, are will already have some kind of inherent retries, right? So when we say pubs of fail, can we assume that it like inherent 
publishing mechanism has exhausted all the retries and then it failed. So we kind of don't need to go out of our way to implement the retry and use the available one. I mean, maybe uh, that this is a good then requirement for the the driver stuff, right? Like it's it's certainly possible to put retry logic in the pub sub driver, um, or or like if the underlying stuff that the the underlying libraries that the driver relies on already does retries, then the driver doesn't need to do anything. Just you know call out to that code directly, right? Um, so as long as it exists somewhere in the contract, sure. Uh, but what we're currently doing is nothing, right? So, so it may retry, it may not, right? Yeah. And that's not something that users, if they want to have PubSub as like a core feature, their compliance bit, right? Having no guarantees as to how hard we try to recover from failures, uh, that's kind of a warning sign, right? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, and just to clarify, it sounds like we are okay as long as we log the pub sub errors for now, just to unblock the alpha, we can always add the retry later. Is that is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to force the discussion Basically, okay. no, I, I, I'm 100% with you. I just want to make sure we are, you know, I'm, I'm hearing you right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I, I, I also put this in the meeting notes. Um, I, I don't know if folks are following along. If not, Xander, can you share your screen? Um, just to make sure this is captured and if folks are okay with next steps. Uh, as a separate PR. All right, are we cool? Yeah, are you good with the next steps here? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks for calling this out. And and yes, we should like remove the two uh, so that not all, not all the pub sub stuff is in audit. Yeah. Um. And and I'm since we're talking about this, and I assume maybe we want the fault all oh, sorry the retry to be configurable, right? Because depending on how often how often you run the audit, how long the cycle is, like how how much you want to retry might be different too, right? Yeah, and um, uh, you know there there's also maybe some memory impact considerations here. Like you could don't spin up a separate thread. To report results, but then if there's some kind of backup, right. uh, you might wind up with the whole audit report in memory, and <laughs> as we know, that could get rather large. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so I think with that, this that should unlock this PR, and I didn't I didn't see anything like uh, like that contentious for other PRs. So I, are we good on, do we think we can get these PRs out this week and then cut a release or, or um, a release candidate, I mean? Nothing comes to mind on the other PRs. I've been out for a few days, so I might be missing something. I mean, one is a doc one, another one is the cache with the extra data response cache, which is just an integration. I, I didn't see anything big there. Uh, I mean, docs, we, we can merge anytime. Uh, right, right. Yeah, the, the cache one, I think I avoided looking at because it was like so dependent on the constraint framework. Yeah, one. that one already merged, I think. Yeah, I think Max approved that one. Uh, yeah. I, I approved it too, and then merged it. Uh, so maybe what what I'm saying is, though, I can't remember the the details of these 
Oh, okay. Pull request right now. Um, the gatekeeper good? one is pretty uh, trivial after the um, the frameworks got merged. Okay, if it's trivial, like basically dependency upgrade, then cool. I remember there being like a lot of like uh, things like how context was was used and and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, previously, but that might have all been swallowed. Um, I mean, just review the PR. I think is ready for you to look. So um, maybe tentatively, let's assuming that nothing big, then we can cut the release candidate this week. Yeah. yeah unless you know you raise a concern, then we will we'll wait. All right. Go. Cool. Are we good? Everyone good? Um on that. Okay. Thank you. Coming back to the agenda, Xander, I think that you're you're good, right? Like anything else you want to? I'm bring? good. That was what I wanted to talk about today. Great. Uh, Max, I added your VAP thing to the agenda because uh, I reviewed it and at left a couple of comments um, that we should probably discuss. Cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, high level, yeah. I think the the doc makes sense. There were just few questions. Yeah, uh, I saw one comment. It's still loading for me. Uh, there's comments. Uh, Failure policy and Gator were validating webhook configuration and match field in the constraint, but I don't think we could get around it. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, should I share my uh, screen or how do we want to? Yeah, that might be easier. Yeah. All right. Where is presenting? Huh, weird. Okay. Oh, that's just says, oh, share screen. It's big it's and green. It's a big uh, green button. But I, I always ignore that. <laughs> yeah. For ironically, the fact that it's a different color yeah, makes I think me so too. it out. Yeah, I, I just skipped that one. Yeah. And why is it an up error, huh? I don't know. Max is fighting his laptop. Again. Oh, let me pause audio share. Sorry. Can can you see my screen? Negative. Negative. Oh wait, okay. it's, it's coming up. It's coming up. Now we see it. Oh, weird. Okay, I needed to like click on the mini screen. Apparently, it, it, as far as I could tell, it doesn't. I don't see any like preview of it or anything. Okay, but y'all could see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So this one, the failure policy fail. Yeah, it's confusing that it overlaps with the failure policy and. Um. In I the mean, I think for the record, I don't think there's anything we can do other than docs. I'm just calling this out as like, it is confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Like if, if we want to track closely the, the schema of validating admission policy, then yeah. Um, agreed. Uh, are you suggesting each max field in the constraint would be mapped to a single expression here for each type of match and cons uh, E.g., there's always going to be three match conditions from a gatekeeper constraint. Yeah, uh, I I don't know if all of them will need an equivalent match condition. Label selector, for instance, like that exists in validating admission policy. It's a you know sort of it's already a Kubernetes convention, so the likelihood that we're going to deviate from that Kubernetes convention as gatekeeper is very low. 
Uh, others like name matching, we already have deviated from Kubernetes convention, right, with uh, prefix and suffix matching, uh, which I think is fine, right? It's probably good that we have more capabilities than is there by default, but that does mean then that we need to be able to add some cell to close that gap. Yeah, um, namespace selector. Like, so if there is, so if, I mean, it's one thing if you have one-to-one, -one, it's another thing you're not, you don't have one-to-one -one, cause, cause this is kind of suggesting it, there isn't one-to-one, -one, right? There, uh, one-to-one -one with what now? Uh, like, like what you said, like namespace selectors, you, you're not going to convert that, right? Or oh, namespace. Not? Yeah, label and namespace selectors are, are fine. Uh, they, they, we could use the VAP flavor as is. Uh, sorry, I just meant like, are you, are, well, what is the conversion for the namespace selector in constraint? How is that going to be mapped to VAP? So, the validating admission policy binding. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I have it here. It, it already oh, has. I see it. I see it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's so confusing. Okay. So basically, we're taking part of the constraint and sticking in VAP, and then the rest of it, you're sticking it in bindings. That's so. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Gross. Okay. Uh, but it is what it is, right? Yeah, at least we can do it. Cat, you do not get my ice. Um, sorry, my cat likes my ice. Um, we need to convert this for the user then. Like we need to do the... Right, yeah, yeah. And this is, this is showing like one conversion as possible and two, here's roughly what it would look like. Gotcha. And the the cell is like don't don't put too much stock in the actual contents of this cell because I kind of wish we map the constrained stuff to binding. That would be cleaner. Map the constraints. Uh, so we do do that for label selectors, namespace yeah, selectors. Um, not one to one. Right. Yeah. Like there's there's no name matching with like prefix and suffix, for instance. Not confusing at all. Uh, well, so, so the good part is that this is invisible to users, right? Like um, this, is, this is all implementation details that we have for ourselves. Um, if, users want to just like think about constraints and constraint templates. They could basically ignore that validating admission policy exists and this should just work. Um, if things get trickier when people, if, if people want to like bring their own validating admission policies, but that's, that's also a different path than, than this design doc is, is about, right? Cause that previous, discussion around we have like a few cycles before validating admission policies is widely available so the idea is to get the the stuff out that lets people do a soft migration first yeah and i guess that in our doctor would have to at least document the mapping like for example, match in constraints. Oh, some some of that is going to be in VAP. Some of them is going to be in binding. I mean, we could document it. I'm I'm curious though why why users would care. Well, because one is sort of like here are the instances of. I mean, kind of like how we design constraint and constraint templates, right? One is the function, one is the instance of that function. 
where and I think binding and VAB is similar in that respect, but but now we're kind of mixing them. So it's not one to one, right? Like, uh, like so, it's not the same as a constraint, right? I get well, so so the idea would be that users don't really interact with BAP objects, which is why I would assume they they wouldn't care so much in in this path. Um, also, how I see it is uh, these match expressions they're they're still going to be parameterized, right? So it, it's it's not going to be we like take their variable names and and like put them in or sorry their variable values and put them into the the uh, validating admission policy. Uh, it, it will it will be one validating admission policy per template. Yeah, and but like but like let's say uh, the match conditions, right? If I let's say I want you know like excluded namespaces, right? Today mm -hmm. I would create two constraints for say you, you know if the the in, the logic is different, right? Or kind, right? Or match kind, but now I'm having to do two VAPs, I guess. No, no, no. O only one VAP. Uh, like if so, if you have like Kate's required labels, right? Mm -hmm. And and you have written it in this validating Kate's native validation or whatever we were gonna call it. Um, it's gonna generate. Uh, let's see, recasting as VAP objects. Yeah, okay. It's going to have two constraints today. Are you saying they're just going to concatenate on the expression? No, no. Uh, the, so the constraints are not consulted in generating this resultant object. This mm -hmm. can just be made from the template, right? So, so what this is, is this is basically the source code of the template. Right, maybe they also have some match conditions. I don't know, uh, but then we're also going to generate additional abstract code for match conditions, right? And so this this Kate's code, or sorry, this um, this code here, right, for for evaluating the the kind selector. And again, mm -hmm. this is like not the actual code. It's much more sure. simple than the actual code would be. Uh, but basically, what this would do is it's just going to uh, look at the match.kind of whatever constraint is being supplied, because we're mm -hmm. going to use the constraint as the parameters object, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's going to make sure that whatever the inbound object is, it satisfies match.kind for that constraint object. But that's by looking at this constraint object as parameters, right? That's not by creating a separate VAP per constraint object. Does that make sense? It does. So I, that's why I, um, so let's say again, let's use a real scenario. So let's say today I have two constraints, right? Mm -hmm. So how, so that will translate to one VAP, but how is it just the expression now uh, includes the match kind from both constraints? No, no. So, so the constraints of no code, right? Constraints are just, and I'm talking about just standard gatekeeper constraints right mm -hmm. now, right? You have, you have match.kinds as pods and deployments, let's sure. say. Uh, so what, uh, and, and let's say we're using Kate's required labels still, right? Mm -hmm. So what would happen is you would have a Kate's required labels constraint template Right, and you would have two constraints. Let's say for some weird reason, they decide to have one constraint for pods and a separate constraint for deployments. I don't and know why. Let's say they, but... they handle different namespaces, let's say. Okay, so you want to do match excluded namespaces or match namespaces. Well, whatever's in the constraint, right? Like basically it's a tuple of what we allow people to configure in the constraint today. How does that sure. translate to the- Okay, uh, yeah, so so let's say if it's in the uh, billing namespace, it requires a 
CIS label, right? And if it's in the production namespace, it requires a I'm so secure label or something. Um, so, so, so you have two constraints, one, one for each of those requirements. Um, what's going to happen is there's a constraint template for Kate's required labels, right? Uh, a user is going to kubectl apply that constraint template. Gatekeeper is going to say, oh, new constraint template. OK, I see it's a Kate's native constraint template. So I'm going to generate a VAP object, right? And that VAP object is going to have that same cell source code that was in the constraint template. Mm -hmm. But I'm also going to inject a match condition that will that knows to look at spec.match dot namespaces. Yep. And and says, okay, if namespace is not in spec.match.namespaces, ignore. Right. And and that that's cell code that is just hard coded into Gatekeeper that it injects into every validating admission policy object it generates from a constraint template. So uh, now the groundwork is kind of laid, right? The user has installed their constraint template. The VAP objects have been auto-generated by some controller. Now the user, kubectl applies those two constraints that, mm -hmm. that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Gatekeeper sees those and says, OK, well, I have a constraint. That means they want to like use this thing. I need to generate a binding, right? And so what it does is it looks at the contents of the constraint. And if it had any kind of like label or namespace selector, right, it would create a binding and add those into match resources because those work just fine. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to, for the parameter reference, right, uh, it's going to use the constraint name. As, as the name of the object to use as a parameter object. And so it, let me know if that gets fuzzy, because that's kind of the, the core piece here. Yeah, I think it's, again, I'm still not clear to me, because at the constraint level today, uh, because of, because of um, match and parameters are together, right? It uh, the logic are the the tuples are basically uh, defined within one constraint, right? Whereas now we're kind of mixing things. Uh, like take this example of the binding, right? Um, again, if I were to have let's say two bindings. Uh, mm -hmm. to, you're using your example. Maybe, maybe all gators must have. Maybe all pot, all pot uh, deployment or pods need to have this owner label, um, ex except cube system, right? Um, and then the other constraint or binding is the CIS label that you talked about, right? For a particular namespace. Now this, like, so in the expression, and let's. Let's just take the match kind and exclude a namespace uh, match conditions, right? So in this case, the expressions will basically have to evaluate all the constraints, right? Like, so, sorry, the expression would have to include all the match kind yeah. and and uh, exclude a namespaces from all the constraints, right? I, it would not. Uh, because what we're adding in match conditions is mm -hmm. the abstract code, right? Like you, you could kind of think of it like we're rewriting, you know how we have the that matcher object, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're rewriting the, uh, the, the Golang source code of that matcher object into cell and injecting that into the constraint template. And then in this case, the parameters all must have owner, right? 
the in, in the constraint, the parameters we're going to pass in is all must have owner, and then th that's going to generate the policy binding with the param ref. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The constraint name okay. is all must have owner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that was a little confusing for me because yeah, it was. But, but again, I'm not seeing where you say for the the owner's label uh, use the expression for these namespaces, right? And then for the CIS labels, use the expression for these namespaces. I, I'm not seeing where we do that. So like uh, maybe maybe a more direct. You so you have something like name gator match or yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I already have it. Gator match excluded namespaces. Beautiful. Uh, so this is this expression is closer to real life. Mm -hmm. uh, accepts spec. <laughs> there we are. Mm -hmm. um, the expression here is is an example of the sort of thing we would inject. Right. This is basically saying not param spec match excluded namespaces. Right. So this is clearly this is like the match field of a constraint. Right. right. And so it's saying for every entry in the excluded namespaces list. Right. There, uh, there, there must not be a match to the inbound objects namespace. Right, so let's take the owner label, right? The, 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 own, the owner's label param is associated with this excluded namespace expression, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, but, no, it's, it's not like, I mean, it, it would use it, right? But there's nothing in this that is specific to any constraint, right? This is abstract logic. This is saying, Okay. If excluded namespaces is defined, mm -hmm. then the inbound object namespace must not be a member of excluded namespaces, right? But it, okay. it doesn't it doesn't know what's in excluded namespaces. So, so it's just it's, scaffolding, right? Is is that so where what do you're you define at? the excluded namespaces? So it um, that's where the binding comes in. Bindings and constraints are one to one, right? Uh, right. VAPs and templates are one to one. Binding and constraints are one to one. But is and this example missing excluded namespace then? Is this example, uh, no, it is not. So the constraint is here, right? So and okay. what's happening? Oh, good. Okay, you're okay. I think I get what you're saying. So you're saying the so you're saying VAP is actually using constraints. The data in constraints. It's actually not, we're, we're not converting it into something that is in VAP. Yeah. Okay, that's the missing piece. Okay. So it's actually reading from constraint. I thought we're just converting. And yeah, no, we're, we're trying to avoid as much that's controller it. stuff as possible. So using the constraint raw as a parameter reference is okay. Okay. one right. way we can go out to, to get. Um, Yeah, because this is recasting as VAP object. So I thought we were just converting it, but it sounds like we're, we're oh, where, where is the excluded namespaces in the in the VAP? Sorry, maybe I missed that part. So excluded namespaces is the the generic logic for it is I, I'm highlighting it. Yeah, where is the value for cube system, for example, in the examples cube system? Ah, so it's it's implicit in param kinds, right? We're saying the which param kind is a validating admission policy thing for they allow arbitrary parameter objects, right? And but you need to specify the the kind for a parameter object. And so we say, well, the param kind is constraints, specifically uh, the case required labels. Ah, okay, I see. Gotcha. And then for the binding, we we say it's actually this specific constraint. 
Yeah, can you add a This is to your point that we don't convert, right? We basically reference that in, in web. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is to the original constraint, which is used as a source of um, okay. arguments, parameters. Um, the source for the or params, I think they call it. Okay. Um, it uses the match kinds except, oh, sorry, in a, for, for match kinds and excluded namespaces, it reads from constraint, but for namespace selectors, it doesn't. It, 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 it uses what, whatever is in binding. Right. Well, uh, because binding, uh, validating admission policy has its own set of matchers. Mm -hmm. Most of them aren't super useful for us. Uh, label selectors and namespace selectors, however, are. Mm. Right, because they, they look exactly the same in both. So why write the code twice, basically? So if, let's say, constraints updates the namespace selectors, it would propagate the change to the binding? Like our, our controller will update the binding, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> but we're not running a webhook, so you know. Well, we are. It's not for this particular constraint. Hmm. Okay, that I think that answers my question here. Um, let me let me noodle on this a bit more, uh, and and then and then I also had the question about um, whether or not you inject the variables in the cell environment versus um, way for a controller runtime to keep up. Uh, yeah, given that this is going to be a continued recurring issue. Uh, can you talk about like, what are the pros and cons of injecting the variable directly? Yeah, so I would say that, first of all, we're kind of in an awkward spot right now where, where this cap is like actively being developed on and there's core features that we would like to use that aren't there. Uh, and that will be relaxed over time. So it, with regard to the, the general, you know, ah, we need to update the underlying Kate's library, we need to update cell. Uh, right now, uh, there's just like fundamental stuff that we would like to use to, to support features that, that, that we would like to have that, that just isn't there. Uh, I think in the long term, the consequences of us being on an older version of the Kate's binary, or sorry, Kate's library or controller runtime or what have you, is that there may be some embedded functionality in cell that Kate's is adding that users can't access, right? Um, which is unfortunate, but you know, uh, kind of unavoidable, um, right? We can't like pre have the functionality. Maybe we do some backfilling or something like that uh, and, and eventually resolvable. The uh, specifically for this variable stuff, this is something that I know is happening because it's like actively being worked on. And I would like to have, because a, a sort of core design principle for the constraint template is the only part of a constraint they can access is the parameters field of the constraint. And the reason why that's important is that then we can modify every other bit of the constraint 
and not have to worry about breaking any template source code, right? Uh, so, so we're free to, if we want to have like extra enforcement actions or, or, you know, modify the schema for match conditions so we can support more environments or whatever other thing we come up with, uh, we could do it and know that it's not going to impact the library. It's not going to impact anyone's custom constraint and, and vice versa. Right. And so. Uh, having that isolation is good. Strictly speaking, because right now we are not relying on Kubernetes uh, VAP being present, right? This is all being locally executed. Kubernetes doesn't yet need to support it, right? If, if we could figure out a way to like approximate how it, it behaves right, locally. But once Kubernetes does support it, we also don't need the updated Kubernetes library to leverage that fact, because all we're doing is generating VAP objects that, that use it, right? So as long as the Kubernetes API server supports variables, we can leverage it regardless of if we can't upgrade to that particular version yet. Does that kind of makes sense. I know there's a lot of like twists and turns there. Um, it might be helpful if you write it in the doc. Uh, like maybe I'll, oh. I'll also use a concrete example. Of yeah, what... I, well, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. But yeah, it, it, it kind of is in the doc. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that for us to use it when it comes time, how we're going to use it is we're going to generate this variables field that I'm highlighting right now. Uh, okay. And that's, that's all we need to do, right? So we don't need to be on the latest version of the Kubernetes API server or Kubernetes library code to do that, right? Gotcha. Um, and, but internally, we just need to support uh, do, 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 do. Where are you? Uh, I know I put something. Uh, oh, there you are. Uh, we just need to support this, right? Mm -hmm. So if if that's a parallel implementation, as long as it behaves similarly, like it's not great that we're duplicating code, but we could just delete it when we upgrade to a version of Kubernetes that actually has that. Got it. Yeah. So you're. This is almost like a proxy in the middle. Like you're kind of creating your own field because it's not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. And what this does is it, it just lets us support it in audit. It lets us support it in webhooks. And then once the thing becomes generally available, we can generate it and users can, can move over, hopefully with low effort, right? The doc doesn't try to discuss when do we try to generate versus not. Yeah. I I think that makes sense. Um, and to your point, we'll remove it in the future. I don't think I have any concerns here. Yeah. Uh, how about other folks? Okay. Yes, not. I think Sertash dropped. Um, all right, let's uh, maybe let's just noodle on this maybe for another week. <laughs> just, sure. just give folks a chance to ask questions, I guess. But I I, I think you explained or addressed all of all my questions. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry, it's a Spartan doc. Some of that was lack of time. Some of that is if I tried to over explain something. Uh, it might be the wrong thing and just everyone gets more confused.
Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely think the, the, like, where do you go, uh, where constraining is a source of truth versus where do we create the mapping is, is a good one to, to clarify in the doc so that we have it in the future when we need to implement as well as document. <laughs> Where constraint is a source of truth versus mapping. So yeah, you're talking about like basically which match fields yeah, are copied like over. Yeah, the highlighted stuff. Yeah, that the the things that there's a comment for. Yeah, if you could maybe clarify that in the doc, that would be helpful. Because in the future, let's say any one of us doing the implementation, it may not be as clear <laughs> unless you go through this recording, maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for the for the. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.